Notice how the world has become smaller? People on other continents have become neighbors. Friends speak different languages. And things that are important weave people and places together. That's why we do things a little differently at International Paper, not just in what we make, but how we do it. Our products make a great deal of difference in the lives they touch from the local town to the global economy. It is a noble task. A purpose of substance, more important than mere commerce. It is why every minute of every day, all over the globe, someone at International Paper is making what matters. Well, thanks for uh, you know being here today. It, um, I'm pleased to be part of, of this discussion and participate in uh, a discussion around sustainable forestry uh, and the key initiatives that are taking place in our industry to advance uh, healthy forests in the United States, but also uh, around the world. Uh, hopefully, you got a sense by listening to the video that sustainability is uh, not only a core value at International Paper, but is an essential part of our business strategy. You know, demand for forest products, which, uh, you know, that's the business we're in, uh, helps drive the need for healthy and sustainable forests, and we really believe that, and hopefully you'll get a sense of that from some of the discussion today. When I, when I look at the panel members, uh, I see uh, a lot of backgrounds, but also a lot of uh, shared interests and goals. Uh, at International Paper, we really believe uh, that the progress that we have made uh, and will continue to make in terms of sustainability around the forest is truly a partnership and a collaborative effort. Uh, just as an example, we're working with the World Wildlife Fund through the Global Forest and Trade Network to promote responsible forestry and combat Ill illegal logging. Uh, we think that's an important initiative, uh, and International Paper's pleased to be at the forefront of that. Uh, one of our more recent partnerships uh, is with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Glad to see Claude Gascon on our panel today. Uh, we're working with the foundation uh, to protect three distinct uh, parcels of land, big parcels of land, stretching across seven southern states uh, in the south. Uh, and our goal with that partnership is, is a public-private partnership, is to rejuvenate uh, and connect forest systems in the southeast and create seamless habitats for wildlife and more sustainable forests, which will also promote the local economies. In terms of fiber supply, I see uh, one of our large uh, fiber suppliers here on the panel as well. Uh, RMS is uh, one of our key suppliers and a key partner in ensuring that International Paper has access to responsibly sourced materials to all our facilities. And just to put that in context, uh, we're a big user of fiber. Uh, about 7,000 truckloads every single day across 27 facilities uh, uh, here in the States. And uh, let me also recognize, I think, the uh, panel leader or facilitator, Donna Harmon, uh, and our longstanding partnership with AFPA. Under Donna's uh, leadership, AFPA does an excellent job, a truly excellent job representing uh, our industry, and we're proud to be a member company. 
So our partnerships uh, here with members of the panel, uh, I think, enhance IP sustainability efforts uh, and make them more stronger and relevant. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Donna. I think you're going to lead the panel. I'm, I'm interested to listen. Thank you, John. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, please enjoy, eat. We're going to do this in a, as efficient of a way as we possibly can. Uh, as John said, I'm Donna Harmon. I'm the president and CEO of the American Forest and Paper Association. AFMPA has been working with ICCF uh, for many, many years, I think since its, uh, its foundation. And I personally have uh, known David Barron and worked with David even before the ICCF uh, was formed when we were working on a more informal uh, in a more informal way to help bring education and information uh, to members of Congress and other policymakers related to important sustainability issues. In the forest products industry, as uh, John mentioned from International Paper's perspective, sustainability is really critical and core to who we are. Uh, for us, it means that we seek to preserve and grow the economic contribution of the industry and the individual companies to society that we work to foster the well-being of the communities where we live and we work, and that we use sustainable manufacturing practices and fiber procurement measures that protect the environment and ensure that our resources will be as available to the future generations as they are today. And AFMPA, with John's leadership and International Paper's uh, strong support, uh, launched a few years ago a Better Practices, Better Planet 2020 initiative that is one of the most comprehensive industry-wide uh, sets of sustainability goals. I think when you leave today, we'll be uh, giving you a copy of the industry's uh, overall sustainability uh, progress and report, and um, would be delighted to have you take take that with you, find some interesting facts and figures. Uh, that is a, as just as a foundation for why we, uh, or why I'm delighted to be here to be part of this panel uh, and to recognize and introduce a, a lot of our uh, partners and, and colleagues who can speak from their own perspective. As we were preparing for the panel, we talked about the, the stories that each of them individually have and how those stories can really take on life and meaning and really help you all as you're, as you're working every day in the Congress and in other agencies uh, across the government uh, to understand from a practical standpoint what sustainability means and what sustainable forest practices look like on the ground. So I'm sure by the time we're finished with the conversation today, you'll walk away with a, a great uh, uh, knowledge base and certainly know that all of these experts are available to you. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Terry Shanahan. Terry is the uh, Vice President for Sustainability for International Paper Company. She's based in Memphis, Tennessee, and she is in a role that is newly established uh, beginning in early 2012. IP uh, established this role of the Vice President of Sustainability, and she's really working to establish or to uh, uh, help the company with their global strategy uh, around sustainability in the triple bottom line. She's been with IP since 1991, and she's held a variety of different positions that help her have a, a really terrific perspective from the customer, from the marketplace, uh, as well as uh, all of the supply chain uh, related to sustainability, which is why she's uh, really terrific in the role that she's in. Uh, an interesting tidbit, an interesting fact uh, about Terry is prior to joining IP, she served as a commissioned officer in the U.S. Navy for eight years. And she was the first woman to qualify as a surface warfare officer on board a combatant ship. Uh, so Terry, I'm sure with that experience, <laughs> this is a piece of cake. <laughs> she earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Minnesota and a master's degree from the Naval Postgraduate School. And next, we'll have uh, Carrie Cicero. Uh, Carrie is the Managing Director of Forests at the World Wildlife Fund. She has been involved with responsible forest management for more than a decade. Carrie and I have been on panels together and uh, spoken uh, to various groups about sustainability and sustainable forest practices. And I can assure you that she's definitely an expert in the field. 
At WWF, she leads a strategy related to forest conservation to produce measurable results in mitigating and reversing the impacts of biodiversity loss, particularly in WWF's priority places. And she really does this uh, in working with the supply chain, uh, working with companies like International Paper, uh, and, and establishing partnerships with a number of other uh, Fortune 100 companies and global companies uh, to help accomplish uh, their objectives. Uh, Carrie also serves on the board of directors for the Forest Stewardship Council in the, in the United States. Prior to joining WWF, she worked as an environmental scientist, a forest inventory researcher, an AmeriCorps VISTA volunteer, and a U.S. Perg field manager. So we're delighted to have Carrie as well. Uh, next, uh, who will be speaking on the panel is Claude Gascon. Claude is the National Fish and Wildlife Federation's Executive Vice President of Science, Evaluation, and Programs. His research focuses on the study of forest fragmentation and the conservation of the Amazon, with a special emphasis on amphibians and wildlife. He also serves as the co-chair of the Amphibian Specialist Group and the Species Survival Commission at the International Union of Conservation of Nature. And prior to uh, joining uh, NFWF in 2010, Claude served as the Executive Vice President for Field Programs at Conservation International, another longstanding uh, supporter and partner uh, of uh, ICCF. Uh, here he directed institutional conservation and science strategies and managed their implementation in over 40 countries around the world. He also served as deputy director of the Center for Applied Biodiversity Science. Claude is the author of three books and more than 70 publications. And he completed his master's degree at the University of Quebec in Montreal and his PhD in ecology at Florida State University. And then finally, to round out our panel, we have Craig, Craig Blair. And Craig is the president and CEO of Resource Management Services a privately held timberland investment firm serving pension funds, endowments, foundations, and family offices. Over a 30-year career, Craig has held a variety of positions at RMS and in the forest products industry with experience in acquisitions, resource planning, forest management, and wood procurement. He now leads an experienced team of forestry and financial professionals that manage a global timberland portfolio of over $4.5 billion. He is the chairman of the RMS Board of Managers and Investment Committee and currently serves as a board member on the Sustainability Forestry Initi Sustainable Forestry Initiative and the National Alliance of Forest Owners. Craig holds a Bachelor of Science degree in forest management from the University of Arkansas at Monticello and a Master of Forestry degree in forest business from Mississippi State University. So I think as you can see, we have a, a well-rounded group of experts that can give you uh, perspectives from all different sides. So with that, we will ask each of our panelists to provide about three to five minutes worth of opening comments. And then we want to really engage you in answering your questions. Um, I know in the sessions like this that I've done previously that the questions from the audience are uh, really why we're here. So uh, we want to make sure that when you leave today, any questions you have about sustainable forest management, what it means, and how these various players in the supply chain are able to contribute to that. So Terry, you're first. Very good, thank you, Donna, and hello, everybody. I'm Terry Shanahan, and it's so nice uh, to see you here. We really appreciate your interest and your participation in the discussion. So um, Donna gave me a very kind um, introduction, and I just wanted to kind of um, mention, start by mentioning that there are a couple of things I'd like to share during these first few minutes here, um, and, then, and then let's talk about what interests you. But there have been a couple of things in the last year since I've stepped into this role with International Paper that have been surprising. And I had been in, for 21 years, in a variety of commercial roles with the company, sales and marketing and business management and all that. And, and in all that time, had really been uh, very happy and very glad about the story of sustainable forestry. And, and a lot of us, I think, who are in similar roles, we walk around feeling so good about the sustainable forestry story and our role in that story. 
But one of the things that, uh, as a company, and certainly as an individual, we've begun to realize more now is that that story is actually not well known outside our small, small little circle of people who live and breathe inside this, uh, this nice industry um, and really make their living uh, via sustainable forestry. And in fact, almost the exact opposite of our story is the one that a lot of people walk around thinking about. And so a lot of people are under the impression that when they use products that came from a forest, they're actually contributing to the destruction of a forest and that that forest is gonna disappear. And the reality, as, as those again who live and breathe in it know, is that the demand for forest products is really what keeps a lot of forest as forested land. And that's especially true here in the US where 70% of our forests are working forests. So they have an economic reason for their existence. You know, we have 500 million acres of working forest in the US, which is, again, 70% of the total forest. And international paper alone, when our customers buy our products, they're contributing to 70 million of those acres of working forest. So when, when we have a chance to tell that story and share that story, we find that people are surprised by it. In fact, I was speaking to a reporter from Fortune magazine not so long ago, and after a conversation like this, she, she paused after asking some questions, and she said, do you realize how shocking this is what you're telling me? So, so that's been the first surprise that we've, we've uh, come to realize is that people don't know our story and it's pretty darn important for us to do a much better job of telling that story. And then an, another incredibly pleasant surprise is sitting right here to my right. <laughs> Uh, when I stepped into this role, I had not had a lot of personal interaction with environmental groups. And candidly, I walked around thinking, you know, people that work for environmental organizations, I, I guess they're kind of crazy. You know, I, <laughs> I guess they're kind of out there. And uh, so one of the first things I did in this role was to come here to Washington, D.C. to meet with the World Wildlife Fund and Carrie and her team. And on the airplane trip on the way over to Washington, I had time to read um, uh, what I had printed out, the Forest for a Living Planet a document. And I would encourage everybody, if you have a minute, to go online and, and look at it. You'll want to print it out because it's, it's probably too long to read on, on the screen, but it's, it's a terrific report. And it surprised me. I, I was shocked by what I read because the World Wildlife Fund was really telling our story. And since then, what we've realized is that together, uh, we're really more credible than we are apart. And that if we really help people understand how sustainable, responsible forestry is a force for good, and yet there are places around the world where people should be concerned about forests, we're probably both going to be more effective. And on top of which, uh, she's just a delightful person and a, a wonderful group of people. Um, and they're not the only group that we've become close to and, and learned that we have an awful lot in common, much more in common than we have differences. So with that, I'd like to um, pause and, and turn this mic over to Carrie. Wow. Well, thank you, Donna and Terry, for such a wonderful lead-in. Um, couldn't ask for a, sort of a better backdrop for, I guess, what I would add to that conversation. Um, much of uh, this happened has happened previously, where much of what I would say, Terry ends up saying, and and so it's, that's this, always the shocking part for me, right? That international paper would get up and give uh, WWF's talking points in in many respects. So I I think what I would do just uh, to help maybe tee up some of the questions and and conversation after our remarks is to flesh out a little bit of what was in that report that so changed uh, Terry's perspective um, as she flew to come meet with us. And the gist of the Living Forest Report is that if we want to save forests, we actually need to log forests. And obviously that needs to be done responsibly and we have a choice about how that is done and we all play a role whether as advocates or as companies or as the government in ensuring that uh, that forestry uh, that will expand and that we need to expand to provide both for a growing population and their needs, but also in the interest of keeping those forests standing, that it's done in the right way. Um, but the reality is that if we look out over the next several decades, uh, say looking to 2050, 
the estimates are that the amount of harvest from our world's forests may need to triple and possibly even quadruple. We, we've been saying triple. I was at the World Bank yesterday. They're saying it looks more like four times uh, the amount of volume um, that we would need from our forests. We need these from our forests globally to provide for us. S but there's only so much forest and land to go around, and we're competing with demands for food, fuel, and fiber from the same land base. So if we look at the rate of deforestation currently, it's about 32 million acres a year. Uh, that's 46 football fields a minute. It's football season, so we can put it in those terms. I mean, that's an unacceptable rate of loss. And uh, when we look at where that deforestation is coming from, soy, cattle ranching, palm oil, I mean, this is what we're competing up against. It's not to say that there are not unsustainable practices occurring to produce pulp, paper, and timber. There are, and that's where we need to focus our effort as well, to level the playing field to make sure that the role the responsible industry can play in keeping those forests standing is successful. So we have to really encourage and incentivize good forest management around the world, create the enabling conditions for that to happen, uh, so that forests are worth more standing uh, than converted to other uses. So there is a very similar message, I think, that plays out uh, between um, the industry and where WWF sees success. Really, the only way we can achieve our forest conservation goals, it's, it's going to rely quite heavily on, on responsible forestry. And that's why I'm so pleased uh, to be able to work with international paper. I mean, we couldn't ask for a more influential and better partner to take that message uh, to a broader audience and to implement our vision for making that happen around the world. So with that, I think I'll just say thanks. I look forward to having further discussion with this esteemed group. Thanks. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Claude Gasco. Thanks for the introduction, Donna. And uh, I made a mental note to review my uh, bio because it's very revealing to have it read back to you. And <laughs> I, I think I need to refresh it a little bit with uh, some more recent accomplishments. Um, and thank you, David, in the ICCF and to International Paper for the invitation to uh, participate in this panel. Um, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, um, for those of you who don't know, is a, uh, a nonprofit organization that uh, has one special characteristic. It was set up in the uh, mid 1980s um, by the government uh, through legislation to essentially uh, establish private-public partnerships to restore and maintain key species and their habitats in the U.S. Uh, in partnership with uh, government agencies that had that mandate and reaching out to the private sector and foundations and corporations. We have many such examples uh, of that kind of work uh, around the U.S. We have huge partnerships with companies such as Walmart, FedEx, uh, Wells Fargo, to name just a few. More specifically, uh, our work with forests uh, have uh, focused mainly in the southeast. And uh, as we all know, these forests in the southeast have suffered uh, some of the most devastating losses in area uh, with the concurrent impacts on, uh, on species in those ecosystems. Um, these forests are among the most threatened in the world, um, as was just mentioned. Yet they do provide multiple benefits to uh, people and to the world, uh, just to name a few in terms of, uh, of, of carbon sequestration and fiber and fresh water, and of course a lot of the species that are found uh, uniquely in these eco ecosystems. So it's obvious that for a foundation like the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, which has a national mandate, it was important for us to look into these ecosystems and the concurrent species within them and look for good partnerships to establish what we call stewardship programs uh, to maintain and restore some of these ecosystems for the long run, not just for conservation, but for uh, working landscapes and being able to derive uh, natural resources into the future. About a year and a half ago, a little less than a year and a half ago, we were uh, approached by uh, John Faraci, uh, who is also a board member of the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, as he joined, uh, to discuss with his senior team at International Paper uh, the potential for a joint partnership in the area of the southeast uh, forests. Um, very quickly, we were able to uh, find some very strong and ambitious common ground based on this long-term goal of maintaining and restoring some of these forests for uh, everybody's benefit. 
And uh, we launched uh, this forest land stewardship uh, program, which is a five-year program with total investment of $30 million, uh, m much of which comes from the company that we will match and leverage. And again, this is aimed at the long-term stewardship of these, uh, of these forests. The outcomes of these programs um, are fairly ambitious, yet we think and we uh, are confident that we'll be able to deliver. We're talking over 200,000 acres of uh, managed, restored, and uh, forced under different types of conservation easements, as well as con direct conservation benefits of many of the imperiled and threatened species within these habitats. Now, we've progressed from that initial concept to implementation. Uh, John mentioned uh, we are working in three different areas uh, in the southeast. We're partnering with uh, government agencies in this work as well. And we've already put some money on the ground, which is uh, remarkable, uh, and uh, have done this in, in this vein of, uh, of a true private-public partnership, which NIFWIF was created to do. Now, all of that is fantastic, and it's a great example of how we have actually been able to move from a concept to implementation and getting money on the ground. Um, but there's one uh, event that kind of, for me, crystallized uh, this partnership as well as the way that partnerships at NIFWIF should continue to develop, as well as representing perhaps uh, the best example that I have of how this kind of stewardship of natural resources uh, can and should be incorporated within the business practice of corporations. And this event happened uh, one of the last meetings where I had my senior team in, in Memphis and John and his senior team were around the table. And we had worked out all of the long-term objectives of this program and we were kind of closing in on, on, on the handshake uh, and the investment that would be made by IP and, and the match that we would bring to the table. And John turned to his numbers guy and he said, uh, what does this represent in terms of, uh, and by the way, IP is putting in seven and a half million, uh, which is not chump change. And so he turned to his numbers guy and he said, what does this represent in terms of, uh, of pennies per ton of paper products? And his numbers guy had crunched numbers on the back of an envelope and came back. It, w it wasn't dollars, it was a couple of pennies, maybe 10, 10 cents a, a ton or something like that. And John kind of thought for two seconds and he said, I think we can pass this through the board. And for me, there, there were uh, obviously, I think at that point, I, I pretty much knew that this was a done deal, that we were going to have a partnership to establish this program. But more importantly, this reflected, in my mind, a very visionary way of looking at these investments from John and, and the IP team of being a business practice that needs to be incorporated within the sustainability model and practices of the company, as opposed to what we usually find in approaching corporations, which only want to do philanthropy and kind of distance themselves from the actual operation. So it was a very revealing moment that I think uh, uh, is a testament to John's vision and also to our partnership, which is truly a business partnership which has as outcomes species and forest land stewardship. So I'm very happy to be here to be able to talk about this and I look forward to some questions. Thank you, Claude and Donna for the introduction. Uh, I may need to borrow a little bit from Claude's resume to add to mine, but uh, uh, I am the, I guess I'm the forester on the panel. Uh, Craig Blair, I'm the president and CEO of Resource Management Service, a firm that manages about 2.7 million acres, uh, mostly in the U.S. South, but also in Brazil, New Zealand, and in China. Um, I'm also a forest landowner. I have some private timber lands that I acquired a few years back, so I have the experience of a an individual that uh, owns and manages land for their own account. And as I said, I am a forester. I'm practicing forestry for now 32 years, even though in my current role, I don't spend a lot of time in the woods. Uh, I still consider myself a forester. Uh, in fact, that's what I placed in my occupation and my tax return. My wife looked at that and looked at me and said, I hope the rest is more accurate. So uh, <laughs> it probably was, but uh, Sustainability for someone in my position, and me personally, is a, a tremendously important component of life. Um, the tract of land that I own, uh, I want to be a good steward so that I can pass that property on to my children and them to their gen grandchildren. It's not something that has a defined ending date. The timberlands that our company acquires and manages are on the behalf of institutional investors. These are 
pension funds, endowments, foundations. Had a conversation with someone on the investment committee of one of our pension clients, and they provide retirement benefits for teachers. And I asked him, I said, well, what's your investment horizon? He said, well, as soon as they quit hiring teachers, we'll tell you. So a perpetual nature, sustainability. The firm RMS, we were founded in 1950 by two visionaries, uh, one in particular, a Birmingham, Alabama native who went to Yale and to Berkeley, came back home and started a company. And there was a very strong stewardship ethic in John Bradley. In fact, in management plans that the firm produced in the late 1950s, well before there was any emerging environmental movement, John Bradley would insert a, insert a stewardship ethic. There was a quote from a Chinese philosopher from about 800 BC, which I really wonder how many of these Southern Timberland owners in 1958 responded to that. But it's been part of the fabric of our firm uh, throughout, its, throughout its history. I guess my comments uh, this afternoon, I would like to have us think about the social benefits, the environmental benefits, and the economic benefits that are produced by working force. You know, I think as over the years, uh, probably even as, as early as 10 years ago, someone in my position or maybe in Kerry's might have thought that those benefits were in opposition, that it was a zero sum game, that you added to one at the detriment of the other. There's been some evolution where I think people start to realize that in fact these benefits are compatible. But I'd like for us to think about them not as in opposition or just being compatible, but really they are, they're codependent. In the long run, if we don't produce environmental quality and social quality and economic qualities from the forest, if we don't have all three, we'll have none. The working forest and the model that we have in the U.S. is a is a great treasure, and it's a great example for leadership around the world. As we look at our business in Brazil and in China, some of the emerging countries, you see a very different struggle to create sustainable use of, of natural resources. I think uh, Terry mentioned that there are about 450 million acres of private forest in the U.S. Um, we grow more wood than we harvest. Inventories are, have increased by about 50% over the last 50 years. The force of the United States store each year 900 million tons of carbon. That's equal to offsetting about 12% of the carbon production of our country. A quarter of the water that is drank in the U.S. is filtered by forest. 60% of the at-risk wildlife species are dependent upon forest habitat. About 40% of the distribution of over 150 bird species are dependent upon healthy forest. They support, in the U.S., private force support two and a half million jobs, an annual payroll of almost $90 billion, with sales uh, approaching $250 billion. About almost 6% of U.S. manufacturing is tied to forest products industry. These are very well managed, very sustainably managed lands. There are over 100 million acres in the U.S. that are certified to credible third-party standards as being sustainably managed forests. But even in the U.S., we do face challenges, and there are threats. Claude mentioned fragmentation. Fragmentation, conversion to other use, starts to change the natures and the benefits of, of working forests. In this country, uh, private forests face threats from overregulation, uh, from loss of markets or inability to grow and develop new markets for the products that are essential. And we do believe that... Uh, we're seeing impacts from climate change that is a broader global threat and one that we see changing the nature, could change the nature of our force. Solutions to these problems, to these threats, require partnership. The level of expertise in the different subject matters, uh, there's no one entity, no one organization that has the experience and the expertise to solve many of these alone. So we embrace and reach out to partnerships with people from the social world and the environmental world as we seek real practical on the ground solutions to the threats to working force and to those benefits. So I do thank you for your time and for the invitation and chance to be part of this panel and uh, look forward to the questions that follow. Thank you. Uh, Terry and Kathy, I really liked what you guys had to say at the beginning about 
how you, know, you need to log to save the forests and, and really bring it up because it's, it's sometimes counterintuitive to what you learned growing up or what you might assume. So I'm really glad to hear you guys say that and really like you guys agree on that. I guess my question would be then, what, where does the recycling aspect come in? What are the financial incentives on the one side and what are the benefits of that on the other side? And Because I know that's a big um, international paper uh, initiative that also just I didn't hear much discussed. I'd like to just hear what you guys have to say on that. All right, so I'll take a stab at that. Uh, recycling is a, is a complex topic, uh, but let me try to, to break it down. Um, it's also one of the shining stars of what is on, uh, on its whole a very positive story of sustainable forestry. And what I mean by that is paper is the most recycled product that humans use. So paper is recycled about 65% here in the US, about 70% in Europe, 45% mm -hmm. and rapidly growing in Brazil. Um, and there's a reason for that. The reason is because there's an economic reason to recover that fiber because it can be reused. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we have found is that it, it doesn't uh, look like it's necessary to mandate the recovery of paper because there's a strong economic reason already in place uh, to recover that fiber. So again, um, we can go into a lot of different aspects of recycling because there are people who, who feel like maybe it should be mandated and maybe it does need a push. But when you look at the data, the data would tell you that uh, there are other product categories that are recovered in the teens, you know, sort of glass, plastic, aluminum, um, or the low 20s. Uh, paper is, is very highly recovered. From our perspective, what's important once you know that you've already achieved a high level of recovery, the most important question then is, well, what do you do with all that fiber after you recover it? It's about 50 million tons, uh, plus or minus, uh, that get recovered here in the US. And the single biggest use of that fiber goes for export. And we think that's a very practical use uh, because it goes to markets that do not have sustainable managed forest available. And so if they didn't get fiber from other countries, like the recovered fiber that we send, uh, they would have to use fiber inside their own country or in other countries that none of us really want to see them harvest. So that's a great use of that fiber. The second biggest use of the fiber goes into unbleached uses, like bo brown boxes and newsprint and unbleached products like tissue. Uh, and that makes a whole lot of sense because for those fibers to go into that, uh, those products, it does not have to be reprocessed and washed to quite the same extent it does for the last and the smallest category, which is going back into white paper. And that's the place where, in our minds, it's not very efficient. It doesn't make a lot of sense to try to force that fiber back into that uh, product category. So, um, so it's a good news story. It's a great news story. Um, again, it's part of the story that isn't well understood, and we, we must do a better job of it. Um, but it's all about, an, in our minds, it's all about pushing that rate up. So instead of the 65%, we'd like to see it be 70%, right, Donna? Uh, we've set a goal uh, with our uh, AFNPA uh, guidance. Uh, the industry in the U.S. has set the goal of, of increasing that to 70% in the near term. Um, but again, once you've achieved a high recovery rate, then what's the best way to use that fiber? And, and we think the markets are probably the most effective way at determining uh, how to use that fiber. I think you wanted to yeah, if I could just add on to that, uh, to Terry's points, because that's a really great question. Is it working? Okay. I mean, no doubt we want to use our natural resources efficiently. And the projections that I offered about uh, the growing uh, volume and demand that will be required, that's with increased efficiency and doing more with less across the supply chain. But I think when we think about where those largest increases in efficiency and fiber use need to come from, we really start looking at places around the world where recovery rates are really low. Uh, so that's where you would want to target efforts to increase recovery rates and increase, uh, you know, you want to see new technologies and increase the efficiency of the, both at the harvest level through to uh, manufacturing and, and, um, and, and the recovery. I guess just to respond to the point about the counterintuitiveness of, of logging to save forests, I, I mean, of course, protected areas are critical for safeguarding the world's biodiversity. I mean, when we think about the species, the sort of iconic species that we care about, they, 
protected areas are going to be the stronghold, sort of the core for those species. But the reality is, I mean, y y we, we did a study looking at great apes in Africa, and most great apes don't live in protected areas because protected areas represent a very limited portion of the landscape. They're living in forest concessions, and so we need to make sure that that matrix, so that the land between the urban areas and those core protected areas is managed in a way uh, where it can remain a viable habitat and also deliver values and services for people. Um, so some studies have shown that, that kind of reiterating that point about uh, that managed forests can be as effective or in some places more effective than protected areas because you have people who have a vested interest in the wood supply wanting to protect the resource. So we really want to tap into that opportunity when we look out across the landscape um, with all the competing needs on it, um, but again, combined with efficiency being part of it, but it's not gonna get us, get us where we need to go from a forest conservation standpoint. I had one thought that occurred that I wanted to share about this. Um, you know, sort of going in the opposite direction. Um, you may or may not have heard news that we announced about a month ago, which uh, makes me feel really sad. Um, do almost entirely because of declining demand for paper products, and, and I'm talking about white paper, not brown paper products, uh, here in the U.S., and that's driven by electronic substitution. Uh, we announced uh, just a few weeks ago the closure of a very large facility in Alabama, and uh, while that results in 1,100 people losing their jobs, and that's, uh, you know, that's a pretty sad comment, those are jobs in a, in a very small town. Uh, where really there aren't a lot of other great options around. So we, we're very sad for our colleagues and, and working hard to, uh, to help them as much as we can. Uh, but it also means that three million tons of wood every year now doesn't have a reason to grow. So uh, our wood suppliers in that wood basket are now saying, gee, you know, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do here. They're mostly private landowners. Many of them are small family um, landowners and uh, they must generate revenue from that land and they've been doing that for decades by selling wood to international paper uh, for the Cortland Alabama mill that's no longer an option because of the decline in demand for paper so it is absolutely counterintuitive but once you kind of work it through and see all those connections um, that's where you do see that the story makes sense Craig uh, one of the things that you pointed out, or, or, or I think uh, that we talked about uh, before this session started, was the different challenges you face in different parts of the world. Terry's obviously you know, raised a, a, a domestic challenge in some rural communities across the country. Um, I wonder if you, from your perspective, and then other panelists, as you all are uh, working in different places, um, either globally or here in the U.S., uh, can Talk for just a moment about some of the differences you see in the challenges from, say, a country like, uh, like Brazil uh, to w the challenges that you face in the U.S. You alluded to that a bit in your remarks, but I thought you might want to just expand a, a bit about the differences in the, in the landscape. Uh, Carrie mentioned the growing global population, the demands on food, fuel, fiber, and forests, and uh, how you see those from your perch as an, a company, a resource manager uh, across the globe. Oops. Thank you. Well, that's a, a very good topic. And um, I know as we look and operate in, in other countries where you don't have the institutions in place with the collective history around conservation and environmental laws that we have in the U.S., then you know, it requires uh, companies to be to be leaders and you know philosophically and as a matter of policy all of the lands that we manage in wherever we own timberlands are certified uh, to a credible standard in Brazil for example we're certified to FSC and and that's part of leadership in those areas to promote conservation and sustainability uh, there are challenges though that are societal there are challenges that Really, we as a resource manager have to understand that there, uh, that there, we have limitations. Uh, you know, I think you try to do as much as you can, raise the bar as much as you can, seek out partners, and you know, and get a little more collective strength to influence the development and the mindset and the 
the practice of resource management. Uh, you know, China is an interesting example, and and similar to Brazil in these emerging countries. You know, that's where we're seeing some of the greatest growth in demand for paper and wood products. The standard of living rise, then people are able to afford and consume goods that use those products. Uh, you may see changes in housing that start to, con, you know, to utilize wood products. So in areas where there's there are poorly formed institutions, there's not a history necessarily of conservation, and there's growing demand, it's just a, it is more of a challenge. And I think that it's incumbent upon us, we feel it, uh, to provide leadership in the lands that we manage and then be active in associations and with partners in these areas to try to try to lift the level of management in, in these countries. So it's a, it does make us appreciate the, some of the things we have placed in the U.S., but, uh, but we're well equipped to provide leadership in these countries. Yeah, I would I would like to uh, ask the the panel a kind of a subset of uh, forestry on public lands. Uh, I'm from I'm from the West, um, and we've uh, we've had a situation now in in the West where almost for three decades we've taken more of a, a passive management on our public lands, and as a result of that we are we have more wildfires, we have more erosion, we have loss of uh, wildlife habitat, monogrowth stands, um, of course, economic impacts of that to communities, and then uh, water supplies for our, our cities and so forth. So I'm wondering, how do we um, turn around the, the public lands as, as they are, are facing all of these, these challenges uh, from basically a lack of uh, active management? Thanks for that, uh, that great question. Um, and in fact, the, uh, uh, I, I think you've touched not just on the public and private uh, uh, dichotomy, but on the uh, perhaps uh, complementary dichotomy between uh, what people have referred to as, as conservation of natural resources and, and use of natural resources. And I, I think uh, from both sides, um, for the benefit of, of the future generations in, in a global sense, I think we have a duty to get away from that dichotomy. Um, and I think the successful organizations and the successful uh, outcomes in conservation and, uh, and, and natural resource management have come from organizations and, and people that have been able to uh, get away from that narrow uh, confrontational aspect of, of it's either or. and. Uh, from our perspective at the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, um, I think we are one of the uh, few organizations that has been able to take uh, a different approach to these uh, dichotomies, which I think have, have not served the conservation world well uh, and have put us in opposition to, to many of the forces that we're trying to, to work with in, in finding these solutions. And I think it comes from uh, different aspects. One, you have to take a very different scale of, uh, of, of vision on the, on the issue. And so you, you kind of have to zoom out from a particular protected area or a particu particular species and look at a larger landscape or a larger area uh, for the same goals, but that can accommodate different uh, people, stakeholders, and uh, sub-goals within a general goal of sustainably managing, whether it's forest or species. And once you do that, uh, I think you allow for uh, this common ground to be found, uh, which is you know, the, the long-term sustainable management, however you want to define that, uh, for a particular resource, because you're allowing for different places to serve different functions, whether they're private lands or public lands. And you have to have that vision because you can not only think of the extractive side of natural resources within sustainable management, at the same time, you can't only think of the conservation side uh, of the sustainable management equation. Those things need to work together. And I think that's been the fault, really, of a lot of the conservation movement in the past is that we've taken one side and a lot of the development side, which has only taken the other. And I think the solutions lie in zooming back and taking a larger scale approach to this where you can actually find room for these different uses and establish these common goals. And I think that's really where we need to be creative. And I think by uh, taking that approach, we're going to find that the restoration aspects of natural ecosystems, again, broadly defined, is going to be the solution to a lot of this. And again, it's not just conservation, but 
planting more trees is probably going to be needed to, you know, supply the demand in the future. Be getting better at managing the, the, uh, the use of, of products is also going to be important. Uh, having places for people to, to use for recreation is also going to be important. All of these uses can only be accommodated within not that this dichotomy, but really this, this gradient of, uh, of perspectives that I think uh, are important. And again, going back to the, the partnership with IP, I think that's at the scale where we were able to zoom out and say these are the goals that we want to achieve and they can accommodate and need to accommodate a whole different set of approaches from conservation easements to better management to, to, to restoration of, uh, of, of forest lands. And all of that is going to be needed for these uses in the future. I would like to ask the panelists uh, their views on new uh, certification requirements for the export of uh, forest products. Uh, one case in point is the European uh, Forest Law and Enforcement and government and trade regulations, the flag that came into force this year. Has the industry seen these uh, new uh, certification requirements as an incentive to a new market or incentive to uh, sustainable forest management? Or has it been the response as an additional cost to an industry that, uh, as the panelists mentioned, needs to grow? Um. Yeah, just very briefly, I would say that I, I think the view from, um, you know, from the uh, most of the industry participants around the world I is rather positive with regard to these efforts to um, to halt or at least to decrease illegal logging. Um, we think it's awfully important <coughs> that illegal logging doesn't occur, and where it is occurring, it needs to be addressed. And so we're uh, generally very, um, you know, feel very positively about that. Not least of which because it can serve to create a level playing field. I'm um, not sure who mentioned it earlier for companies that are, you know, operating uh, on a, uh, with a legality focus. So, um, so again, that's just sort of a general perspective, but I think that would carry across uh, a good bit of the um, uh, forest products producers. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, the, the efforts that you <laughs> reference, the forest law enforcement and governance and trade, um, they're also obviously the Lacey Act here in the U.S., the EU timber regulation, I mean, here in the U.S., we actually uh, played a really leading role, but others quickly followed. I mean, EU, the EU timber regulation came right on the heels. You now have Australia uh, has adopted similar legislation, and even China, we hear from our colleagues, is looking at new guidelines for uh, importation of timber into China. So th I think that's all really positive. I mean, for the reasons, I, I think, as Terry mentioned, to allow responsible business to flourish, but also for the reasons from a conservation standpoint, just when we look at the impacts of illegal logging. And what we're learning is that there are very, uh, there, are, there are links to uh, wildlife crime and wildlife trafficking in terms of the same uh, criminal syndicates, the same trade routes, the same countries. I mean, these are all very concerning things uh, for us as, as people, I mean, as well as um, governments and companies. So. Um, our experience in with the companies that we have partnered with around the world uh, through our global forest and trade network, so there's over 200 companies that we're working with around the world, is that um, they want to understand you know, what the, the rules are and how to comply, uh, but that it's already starting to change practices. And I think for the responsible business, it's reinforcing what they've already been doing. I mean, the good companies were looking at where their forest products were coming from, they were starting to ask some of those same questions. Um, so now it's really, I think, f making that become the norm. You know, it's no longer acceptable to say, you know, the wood came from the loading dock or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, right, I mean, it's, it's really becoming more the norm. And we've seen that happen just within, I mean, that's within this decade, a very dramatic shift. And that, I think that only bodes well for the companies who are trying to do things responsibly. I really don't have too much to add to that. Clearly, uh, the source of raw material for any paper forest products manufacturing entity should be something that we can verify uh, that it not be illegally logged is not a real high bar. And I know in places <laughs> in the world, it's, we're just getting there. And that's part of the example in some of these countries. There are conditions that are puzzling to us, but they exist, and that's real world. I would think generally, though, as consumers, as people developing government policies that encouragement of more lands to be 
certified through credible standards that they are sustainably managed, which would include not illegal logging, but a much higher bar than that, that that's where we, again, that's where we need to move to if we're going to, again, to enjoy the environmental, the social license to continue to manage forests that we have today, uh, but that to continue to promote certification is, is a way that society can know that proper practices are in place. Uh, my name is Clayton Adams. I'm from the UN Environment Program, but actually also uh, uh, asked this question because I have uh, come from a family with substantial forest and timber interest, interests in South Alabama. Um, Mr. Blair, uh, you identified uh, climate change as one of the potential th or one of the threats that you are seeing. I've, I'm curious as to how you're seeing that being manifested in the American Southeast, but then to the wider panel of how what you're thinking is on climate change in forest. Um, you know, I guess in terms of specific things in the U.S. South, I think we haven't seen some of the more telling indicators that we've seen in other parts of the world. I think you've seen areas where on the fringes of, of, of macro or, or kind of microclimatic changes where changes in rainfall. I was having a, you know, a conversation with someone earlier today about uh, changes in Africa where long-standing 600 millimeter rainfall patterns have, have changed. And, you know, some of that was due to changing forestry practices, mm -hmm. but you know, I think what we've seen is if there's a trend of warming, then there will be changes in, in fire systems. There will be changes in insects. We've seen uh, dramatic insect infestations in Western Canada, the mountain pine beetle. You know, it's really difficult to draw a clear, direct line between you know, the indications of climate change and these specific indicators, but it's not that difficult to draw a good logical line uh, between the long-term threat uh, for changes in the climate to, you know, the, the vegetation that we have where it is is a function of the climate. And as that changes, that, that vegetation, those patterns will change as well. Uh, one thing that seems to be prevalent is more volatility in things, which increases risk to forced landowners and economies around the world. Well, I might just ask each of our panelists uh, if they have any final thoughts. We have um, a, a few more minutes here, and I'm sure that our panelists are uh, happy to stay around in the event that some of you want to ask them questions individually. But if each of you would just uh, take a minute or two to give your uh, a final sort of summary wrap-up of the one thing each of you would like our uh, audience today to know and understand about sustainable forestry and uh, the role of your organization or the, the uh, collective role of partnerships in accomplishing that objective. Thanks, Donna. And again, thanks to everybody for being part of the conversation today. Uh, I guess my parting uh, comment here, and again, definitely happy to have more dialogue after we conclude, um, is that at International Paper, we're remarkably pleased uh, to be able to touch so many of the forests of the world. And when our customers buy our products, that results in an economic reason for those forests to exist. And again, here in the U.S., that's 70 million acres of forest. We, we haven't measured it for the footprint uh, we have around the rest of the world, but we're, we're in the process of doing that. But it's a big, it's a big number. You know, it's a lot of forests that we're able to contribute to and help them have a reason to exist for a long, long time to come. I'd, I think a second thing I'd like to make sure everybody takes home is that out of the 4 billion hectares, which is roughly 10 million acres of land that is forested on the earth, uh, less than 1% of the wood that grows on those acres is, is harvested each year. So the inventory is in relatively healthy shape. And the same is true here in the U.S. I think Craig mentioned that the inventory has been building for 50 years. Um, so while the picture is generally speaking, very positive. We do share concern uh, with WWF and others, uh, NIFWF especially, where there are places that do need special protections. So I do think that Craig did a wonderful job of talking about this interdependency of the economic, the social, um, and the environmental concerns uh, that all of us share. And, uh, and it's only through these kinds of conversations and these partnerships that we're able to advance all three of those, not just one. So thanks again. Right. Thanks, Terry. I guess I would leave with a couple points uh, to start with just to stress how important forests are. I mean, that's come through in all of the 
conversations from an economic standpoint, from a climate standpoint, obviously from a biodiversity standpoint. I mean, forests are uh, home to 80% of terrestrial biodiversity. And it's the loss and burning of forests that contributes up to 20% of greenhouse gases, the second largest uh, source of, of greenhouse gases. And combine that with the with illegal logging and kind of impacts, the direct impacts on the forest, um, they're under pressure. They're under pressure for all these demands for food, fuel, fiber. Um, but at the same time, we have this, we have these tools uh, for conservation and they include among them uh, responsible forest management. So there's this huge opportunity to work together, you know, across, uh, across what previously perceived lines uh, uh, that may have been drawn. Um, and I, I guess I just leave with the call, uh, kind of the call to action um, for um, the role that both governance, governments, private sector, governments, both here, both the government here as well as, as around the world, um, the roles we can play to create the enabling conditions for good forest management so it can really uh, become um, that force for conservation uh, that it can be. Thanks. Uh, if I had a wish, it would be essentially to be able to clone the IP leadership and <laughs> insert it into many other corporations around the world because of the uh, vision that they have and, and the way that they have understood the need to uh, be good stewards of, uh, of the natural resources on which they depend. Um, and the foundation really is, is, is a vehicle for those kinds of partnerships, which uh, I think right now um, our partnership with IP is perhaps the best demonstration of how uh, government agencies and, and private sector can really work together and find some of these creative solutions. I would extend this not just to forest. I think all of our ecosystems, freshwater, coastal, marine, et cetera, uh, are in need of some of these same creative solutions. And uh, I would invite everybody to come and uh, discuss these solutions with the foundation and in uh, the future. Thank you. Well, if you're <coughs> well, if you're a consumer of paper products or building products, I would first tell you to look for the label find and see it that it is sustainably managed and sourced. So look for SFI or FSC. If you buy products that have those, those sustainability labels on them, you can be assured as a customer and a consumer that, uh, that those were sourced with sustainably managed, provided fiber and sustainable through the supply chain. Um, if you're involved in policy making, as a private forest owner and a manager of Timberlands for investors, I would ask you, when you come to the regulatory table, stop and take a deep breath, make sure that additional rules are needed and have benefits. Consider the costs and the, you know, the, the impact that you have on the economic benefit that is one of those three stools to the, the three legs to the stool. Um, and finally, I'll just leave you with a thought that's not original to me, but a good friend of mine and someone I respect very much, Larry Seltzer, who leads the Conservation Fund, describes our forest as the green infrastructure of the nation. And the ability that you know we must rely and maintain a healthy infrastructure to get these broad benefits to society, clean air, clean water, wildlife and species habitat, biodiversity, carbon storage, jobs, and the health of the rural communities throughout the country that depend on this industry and this asset. So uh, thank you for the time here today.